It's time to rock your midlife with Dr. Ellen Albertson. Are you ready to get real, break through, and learn how to make your midlife the best time of your life? Take on those life challenges and turn them into opportunities? Let's rock. Here's Dr. Ellen. Hey, everybody. Dr. Ellen here, the Midlife Whisperer. I am so thrilled that you are with us today. If you are new to the show, welcome. If you're a return listener, thanks for being here. Hey, if you like the show, please leave a review. Let me know what you like. And you can always reach out to me at themidlifewhisperer.com. That's themidlifewhisperer.com. We have an awesome show today. My first celebrity, we are going to be talking to Mr. Ed Begley Jr. And he is going to be sharing his wisdom, his stories, and be helping, helping us really to up our ability to support the planet and the environment. And you know, with all the craziness in the chaos in the world, the violence, issues like famine and environmental issues, as midlife women, it's so easy to ask questions like, how can I make a difference? Where do I have power? What can I do, build or create to have a positive impact on the planet? I find that a lot of midlife women, we feel kind of helpless, like we're stuck or overwhelmed with all the issues. And I'm here to tell you the truth is you are not powerless. As midlife women, we impact up to four generations. So we've got our grandkids, our kids, our peers, our parents. You know, and as midlife women, we are powerful. We still have tons of energy, tons of resources. You know, and also, you know, myself, so much drive. My kid turned, my oldest turned 25 today. And I was like, wow, we got to do something about this planet because. She's like, I don't want to have kids yet if things don't turn around. And we all really have so much that we can do. I love the Gandhi quote that says, you know, be the change that you want to see in the world or the Marian Williamson quote, you know, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light not our darkness that brightens us. We're scared sometimes of how powerful we can be. So here's what my suggestion is. We're gonna give you tons of suggestions today. You might wanna grab a pen and, and a piece of paper to write some things down, but you are the boss of your life. That's right. And how you lead matters, how you show up for your life, how you lead in your life matters, how you talk about what matters to you really makes a difference. Your words, and your actions are impactful. You know, and when you realize this, when you bring this awareness into every moment of your life, you start to engage with your own personal power and agency in an entirely new and different way. And in this week's show, we're going to share ways you can make a difference, particularly on the environmental front. Again, we're going to be talking to seven-time Emmy Award-nominated actor and environmentalist Ed Bigley Jr., and he's going to be sharing what each of us can do to start living more sustainably. You know, I've been thinking about this a lot myself. I live in Vermont, and I do so many things to live lightly on the earth. And as I've been sharing six weeks ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer super early. It's just stage 1A but I'm doing everything I can to detoxify my body. Um, and so there's so much that you can do, which is gonna help the planet and your well being. This isn't a sacrifice. This is something that feels so good. So myself, I have cut out basically all processed food. I've pretty much been eating that way for years, um, but I'm really working more also on my personal care products. So, you know, shampoos, soaps, deodorants, um, Hair gel has been a little bit challenging to find the right hair gel that is uh, environmentally safe. Certainly um, products that you use to clean your house, get rid of those toxic, those products, those things that contain chlorine and ammonia. And there's so many great green products that we're going to be sharing with you as well today. Um, and other things that you can do is, you know, use a metal or glass water bottle instead of using those plastic water bottles that contain toxins you're also helping to keep those plastics out of the landfill. So get yourself a great used water bottle or two. I just bought two over at Costco. They're huge and they are stainless steel. Um, I bring my bags to the grocery store. That's something a couple of years ago, I made a resolution on New Year's. 
just put them in my car. And it's so nice because um, in a lot of states now they're charging. So in Vermont, they're charging 10 cents a bag. And the also great thing is that when you get home, you don't have these bags that you have to dispose of. So get yourself some great recycled bags that you can use over and over again. Um, get rid of your lawn. Like we have a small lawn, um, but we let most of our land, I live on 10 acres in Vermont. So most of our land is totally natural and it's become this amazing habitat. We probably have 20 different species of migrating birds and we have butterflies and bees and hummingbirds that are pollinators. You can grow plants that attract the birds and the bees so that they pollinate things. We have to protect our bees. It's so important. Our neighbors actually have a hive. So we see their bees over on our property. Um, we also grow our own food, which is awesome because there's zip finger uh, footprint because we are not, not getting in our car. We're using the, um, the manure from our a local farmer. And so we just have this beautiful garden that we're growing and harvesting, um, replacing your light bulbs. Super easy to do. Again, going to save you money, not a hardship. And remembering to turn off the lights, um, walking and biking rather than taking your car again, great for your well-being. Um, and so in terms of diet too, I just wanna uh, say, I've been a dietitian for almost 30 years. You know, diets come and go, but there is one diet that does it all. It's the whole foods plant-based diet. So maybe go by the Mediterranean or the DASH, but this diet is really about eating more plants. And you might not realize it, but livestock takes up nearly 80% of global our agricultural land, yet produces less than 20% of the world's supply of calories. So animal products are very um, intensive in terms of land usage, in terms of resources. I think I read once that eating a hamburger is like the equivalent of driving your car 20 miles or so. And I'm not saying you've got to become a vegetarian, but you can start to make changes and meat accounts for nearly 60% of all greenhouse gases from food production. It also is responsible for habitat loss, land and water pollution. So it's cutting down on meat is, a, is something that you can do. You can start by thinking about animal products, you know, more as a condiment. So like stir fries or soups, like sometimes I'll throw a little bit of meat in my dishes, a few shrimp, just as a flavoring, it's kind of, if you think about um, ethnic cuisines, they do that a lot. You might want to start like a meatless Monday where you buy like veggie burgers or those great soy crumbles. Um, you can substitute a category. So again, instead of having your, you know, your conventional animal products, see if you can find a veggie equivalent. There are tons and they're sold everywhere now, even at, you know, Trader Joe's, Costco. Um, I love personally the, um, plant-based, um, bean-based pastas. So that's like double duty. So you're getting your protein and you're getting your pasta. So just saute, steam, throw in some raw vegetables, toss it with your pasta, with your beautiful fresh tomatoes from the garden. And you've just got a beautiful dish. Get yourself maybe a new vegetarian cookbook. I promise you that the planet will thank you. Your body will thank you. Even though I've been diagnosed, I feel amazing. My vibration is so high. You know, I know most of my body is made from plants and plants come from the sunlight. So it's really one of the best things you can do, whether you want to just feel great, look amazing, you want beautiful skin, you want to drop a couple of pounds, you want to, you know, live to a hundred, reduce your risks of chronic diseases. The plant-based diet is the way to go. So let's talk a little bit about what you can do in terms of your cleaning products, because that's kind of a new area that I have been tackling. And we are going to be talking to Ed Begley Jr. And you probably know him from movies and television series. If you're a Gen Xer or baby boomer, I'm sure you have seen and enjoyed his performances. He's currently reoccurring on the CBS series, Young Sheldon. Um, and he was recently on the series, ABC's Bless the Mess and Netflix Future Man. He has also joined the cast for the reboot of the series, Queer as Folks. But you might not know on the environmental front, he is one of the foremost environmentalists in Hollywood supporting and advocating for multiple eco initiatives and charity organizations. 
He is also the name and face behind the successful Begley's Earth Responsible Products, which I have been loving and using. It's a line of plant-based, eco-friendly cleaning and pet supplies. My dog Rosie loves the pet bathing supply and she's a border collie. She gets really dirty here on, here in Vermont. Um, all the products are available at amazon.com and at walmart.com and they're going to be on chewy.com soon, which is a great place to go for all your pet needs. He is a Golden Globe and seven-time Emmy Award um, nominated actor who for decades has been a champion and educator for causes dedicated to protecting the earth. In support of this work, he starred up opposite his lovely wife and daughter on the hit Echo reality shows, Living with Ed and on Begley Street. And he's gonna share a little bit of his um, celebrity stories as well as what we can all do to protect the planet. So I'm so honored to have you, Ed. Thank you for joining Rock Your Midlife. Ellen, I'm in the wrong seat. I wanna be interviewing you. You're <laughs> doing so much wonderful stuff and you're so eloquent about it. It's just wonderful. I'm just very impressed with everything that I'm hearing. And having me on a show that uses the term midlife I'm clearly out in the back nine. I'm in act three here, so I'll happily say midlife and uh, be part of uh, your wonderful generation of people who would qualify in the midlife. I'm 72, but I feel very good. I've been a vegan uh, most of my life and I really, uh, I feel very, very good. Uh, you know, I, I have a wonderful vegetable garden. I'll go low tech here and I should have it on my computer, but I don't know, I have it on my phone. If I hold it up here, oh, wow. perhaps you can see it. I've got a beautiful- Yeah, that's beautiful. Like, I've got my corn in there already. I got my tomatoes in. I've been having lettuce all winter, of course. Lettuce you can have year round in California and carrots and broccoli and everything. And uh, I've got a, always had a productive vegetable garden since 1979 when I bought my first house. One of the main reasons I wanted a garden, Ellen, was to, so my kids knew where, the, where food came from, that they knew it came from the earth and not from the Ralph's tree or the, you know, the Safeway bush. Yeah. I wanted to know where food came from, from healthy soil, clean water, sunshine, and some very enjoyable work. And so they, my grown kids, 43 and 44, have known that their whole lives. My 22-year-old knows that. My grandkids know that in all practices. So uh, I feel very blessed. And thank you for mentioning the non-toxic cleaners. Uh, I've been doing that for a while now. And I, I started by just using vinegar and water and baking soda back in 1970. And a lot of cleaners have come a long way. So I'm very happy to promote them and thank you for doing the same. Oh, sure. Well, we're going to get into it and talk all about it, but just talk a little bit more food. Well, I'm in Vermont. We had kale until the middle of January. Our I love electric it. bill went through the roof, but my uh, my fiance is this incredible master gardener. I always wanted um, to do community supported agriculture. And then I met Ken and he, our first date, he wheeled in this cooler filled with cauliflower he'd grown and basil and tomatoes. And so he can't cook. So we're a really, really good couple. So it's, it is so it's much a fun. It's a good if match. Yeah, it's great. If you're listening, you know, you don't have to go crazy. You can put a couple pots out. You can grow lettuces, yep. like cherry tomatoes. Something that I have been loving lately is sprouting. And I've gotten these great hemp bags. And I just take the sprouts, throw them the, from the sprout man. I throw them in the bag. I dump them in water. You soak them first for about eight hours. Then I dump them in water morning and evening, drain the water so that they can dry in between. And in a couple of days, I have sprouts, which are incredible for, for you. So, so much that you can do. Something I talk about on the show all the time is whole food, plant-based eating. But let's talk a little bit deeper about environmentalism. So how long have you been environmentalist? Probably before environmentalists were even a thing, right? I started with the first Earth Day in 1970. But it began before that because my dad, you know, was the son of Irish immigrants. He lived through the Great Depression. He was a conservative, but he liked to conserve. And so, you know, I just learned to turn off the lights, turn off the, you know, air conditioning and everything, turn off. We didn't have air conditioning now that I think about when I was a kid, but just save everything and don't waste. So he died within a few days of the first birthday. So I did a lot of this stuff to honor him in 1970. And also at that point, Ellen, in 1970, I'd lived with smoggy LA, that horrible smog, for 20 years, for two decades. And as a young kid, I didn't have asthma, but I couldn't breathe. I would talk, as many kids did, like this. And again, some with asthma, some without. I didn't have asthma, but you just had trouble breathing for many, many, most of the days of the year, all but a few dozen or maybe 40, 50 days a year right after it rained or the winds came in, you could then breathe more easily. But the rest of the vast 300 plus days a year, 
it was very difficult to breathe. So when they said, we're going to have something called Earth Day, I went, what are you going to do? We're going to clean up the air, they said. I went, sign me up. I bought my first electric car. I started recycling. I became a vegetarian. You know, uh, I took public transportation, rode my bike, started composting in an apartment. Uh, I bought a diaper pail with a lid on it. And I didn't really, I realized I didn't have a place to take it. So I took my little electric car. I went near the railroad tracks and I found a spot. I had a shovel and I dug just to put it back in the earth. And here's a miracle, Ellen. Your listeners will appreciate this and you will. It st things started to grow there, even with complete neglect. You know, there was a, enough rain or what have you. Some cherry tomatoes started to grow in this hole by the side of the railroad tracks. So I saw how incredible it is to grow things. And then when I had a, an apartment that allowed me to do so, I grew some stuff there in a, a better way than by the railroad tracks. And I've been doing it my whole life, having fresh food. And uh, I ate, I've been eating a plant-based diet for many, many years. And I, I just love it. And I feel pretty good for a guy who's 72. Yeah, you look amazed. And I would say that's something if you're listening and you're writing down things you can do is recycling. So we recycle everything and we compost. And the fun thing about composting is our squash just grows spontaneously. And last year, what ended up happening is the pumpkin somehow mated with all the other squashes. So we got all of these like spaghetti squash and like um, acorn squash, all of these uh, butternut squashes that had this deep orange outside. And they were sort of this interesting hybrid, but it is incredible hybrid. how nature will do its thing. It's, it's super fun. So I'm curious about this electric car thing. Were there electric cars in the 70s? They were very odd, very primitive, but I had, well, let me back up. Henry Ford's wife preferred her Baker electric car to his noisy contraption. That was a, you know, 1910 car. Uh, Jay Leno had one of those for a while. That was a very expensive collector's item. I did not have one of those. What I had was called a Taylor Dunn, D-U-N-N, Taylor Dunn electric car. I should be more precise and say electric cart. It was more like a golf cart. I was the only person under 65, I was told, that bought one of these. They used them in like retirement communities to go to a Mahjong tournament or, you know, to go to the market, people in retirement communities that didn't want to go to a gas station and you just charge it at home. And that's what I did. And I drove it around and I realized it was not only good for the environment, but it was good for my pocketbook. It cost less to plug it into the wall and go X amount of miles the same way an electric car does today in 2022. It costs you less to plug an electric car, go 50 miles and it does 50 miles worth of gasoline been that way since 1970 about my first electric car and it's much 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 cheaper to maintain there's no tune-up oil change fan belt radiator flush smog check valve job you know there's just none of this normal maintenance that you have with a traditional combustion engine so i knew that was good and i stuck with it bike riding kept me fit and i i like that pretty soon i had enough money to, i saved enough money i could buy a little you know, uh, solar oven to cook some meals. Pretty soon I had enough money to buy a little rain barrel. After 15 years of doing all the cheap and easy stuff, I could afford solar hot, hot water in 1985, 15 years later from the first Earth Day. 1990, I could afford solar electric. So I took my time. I behaved in a fiscally responsible manner. I wanted electric, you know, fancy electric car in 1970. I wanted solar panels in 1970, but I couldn't afford them, so I waited and did it in a financially responsible and sustainable way too. And now I can live very cheaply because of all these good investments I've made over the years in solar on my rooftop and a very good electric car and a good solar hot water system. So it's a good financial plan to live in a green fashion. It's good for that other green stuff called money. Yeah, that's really true. And the thing about, I, I have a hybrid and what I love about it, first of all, is Yes, the gas, especially with gas in some places being like 750 a gallon now. I know. It's really quiet and the pickup is outrageous. When my 20 year old son who loves cars gets on, he's like, wow, mom, your car just, you know, goes really, the pickup on it is amazing. But I love what you're saying about um, doing it gradually. So if you're listening, and again, this empowerment piece, right? You have agency, do just one thing, replace your light bulbs. You can do things. I mean, if you're thinking about like our neighbors are building and they're deciding between um, 
we don't have a, it's pretty dark here in Vermont. A lot of the days we have a lot of days that are, uh, are overcast. So they're trying to decide between wind and uh, doing solar, but you know, investigate a lot of times you can find companies that they will rent your rooftop. Basically and they're leasing yes. your house and then you're actually getting free electric and also maybe more money on top of that. So there's lots of creative things that are happening um, out there, but do it gradually. And I would say too, any changes you're making, whether it's to be more environmentally sound or something in your lifestyle, do it because you love yourself and you love the planet and you love your kids, not because you feel guilty, not because you feel like I should stop shooting all over yourself. I did a reel about this a couple of days ago. You know, just change to I should when you think, oh, I should recycle, I should eat more vegetarian, I should change my car. Change that to I want, like I want to live lighter on the earth. I want to be healthier. I want to eat more plants. It will really change things for you. So I want to talk a little bit about the problem, Ed. Is the problem getting better or worse in terms of what's happening to the climate? Certainly we're seeing, you know, more floods, more forest fires. It's getting hotter on the planet. What are you seeing from your perspective in terms of the shift that's happening um, on the earth? Sadly, climate change has advanced now from when we first started to talk about it with James Hansen in, uh, in Washington talking to our senators like Al Gore asked him to come there in the, in the late uh, 80s and 87 really is when it happened. The fix in the 80s or 90s or the aughts would have been so much easier, but sadly there wasn't the political will to do it. Now it's going to be very difficult to do, but that shouldn't stop us. We have to do it now more than ever. Just the wildfires are going to take more and more land, more and more houses, more and more wildlife, animals killed, plants killed, all of which we rely on. You know, we, we have to do it. Uh, and you think of all the challenges we have like climate change and the death of many coral reefs and what have you. And those are things that frighten people. And sometimes it immobilizes people. Don't get caught up in that because we've also had many successes. And Ellen, I'm sure you agree, we have to celebrate those too. We have four times the cars in LA from 1970, millions more people, yet we have a fraction of the smog. We've done that because everything we hope would work, cleaner power plants, you know, less, less polluting vehicles, cleaner vehicles and all that stuff, it all worked. Four times the cars, millions more people, yet a lot less smog in LA. Now, having said that, it's not better everywhere. The people that live near fulfillment centers or the ports of Long Beach or Los Angeles, these uh, poor communities, are still suffering bad air pollution. People around the fires, we have some of the worst air pollution in the country, again, because of the many wildfires. So if we had just done what was recommended by Nobel laureates and people very knowledgeable about climate many years ago, we would have been further along, but let's not get hung up on what was. This is what is. We have to, from this point forward, do what we can. As you wisely said earlier, you know, you got to do it in a, in a way that's scalable. You don't run up Mount Everest to get to the top. You get to base camp and you get acclimated and you climb as high as you can and do it for the joy of it, as you said. You pick the low-hanging fruit, fruit first, as you suggested. You get some light bulbs if you like them. And they're much warmer colors now. They look much better. My wife even likes them now. Get those LED light bulbs. They're cheap and they look good. Get an energy-saving thermostat. Put it in and program it. Get some weather scripting, put it around your doors and windows. All these things are very cheap. Ride a bike if weather and fitness permit. Take public transportation if it's available near you. The one big thing you said, and it's a big one, eat more plant food. It's good for you and good for the planet. All those things are very inexpensive. Do them and you're going to save money and you're going to protect the environment and mitigate climate change. Yeah, it is really important because um, things aren't getting better. And I just feel like with you know, we're focusing so much, you know, it's important that we're focusing on what's going on in Europe and Ukraine and what's focusing on with gun control. But it feels like the climate piece is like the whole planet has to come together. Like people don't get that we are one species and we all live on the same planet and we're all interrelated and we're all breathing the same air. And if we don't really start to focus on this, it's we're not going to have a planet to live on. Now, we're like fish you know, in an aquarium who've learned to nibble at the controls without any idea of what the consequences are. And we're changing the temperature of the aquarium, this, the aquarium being the planet, of course, in this case, this beautiful water planet that is so unique in the solar system, in the universe, what we know of now, it's quite unique what we have. It's very special to have life on a planet like this. So um, we have to protect it for ourselves and our 
children and grandchildren. We have to protect it for the joy of it, for the many animals and plants we share this planet with. It's just something that makes sense in every way. And so urge people to do something and know the challenges, climate change, loss of coral reefs, many other challenges that we have, but know the successes. Cleaner air in many parts of LA much of the year when the fire, fires aren't raging. Uh, the Cuyahoga River caught fire in 1970, Ellen. A river caught fire near Cleveland because there was so much pollution on it. Somebody lit a match too close to it and a river caught fire. I don't know about you, but I think it's a bad sign when our rivers yeah. catch fire. So that happened. That doesn't happen anymore with the Cuyahoga River. The Hudson River is so polluted you couldn't eat the fish from it. That's been cleaned up to a large degree now, the Hudson River. So uh, there's much that we can do. We have to come together and do it beyond partisan politics. We have to do it both sides of the aisle working together to have a cleaner planet. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, I, I lived in uh, near Austin, New York, and Pete Seeger would come over, over across the Hudson and do his singing and talk about the, you know, environmentalism. And it really is something I think that we're, we're really all aware of. What about political action? If people feel like inclined to talk to their senators, congressmen, any thoughts about what people can do politically? I'm so glad you brought that up. There's really, everybody is been very laudatory over the years about some of the stuff I did, the personal action stuff that I've done, and that's important. But that's just one column in the structure that has held up all good financial change, like cleaner air in LA much, much of the time because of the changes we made and a cleaner Cuyahoga River that doesn't catch fire. That's all happened because of three things. One is what I've done, my personal choices to ride a bike and buy an electric car and get solar panels, very important. The other one is corporate responsibility to get corporations to do the right thing. And keep in mind, Ellen, those two are joined together because if you have more green products, a company is making more green products, people are going to buy them. People show that they want to buy more green products, companies are going to make them. And the third and very, very important one, all need to be of equal length, good legislation. The Clean Air Act is how we cleaned up the air in LA. We use the enforcement, the legal cudgel of the Clean Air Act to get the Air Resources Board in California and the, the AQMD in the LA area to clean up the air. We sued people. You hate to have to sue people, but we had to, to get cleaner air and it worked. Cleaner power plants, cleaner vehicles, everything that we did big and small in LA led to cleaner air. Now we got the fires raging and we're backpedaling. We have to move forward. We have to get back to where we were headed and we can do it, but only with those three pillars, personal action, corporate responsibility and good legislation. All right. Well, we will be back. We're going to take a short break. Ed, I love your passion. We're going to be talking more about personal responsibility and what you can do. We can talk about collectively how we can really vote with our dollars to get corporations more on board. And then, of course, talking about what, what we can do to through, through our voting and through our political action. Stick with us, folks. We'll be right back. You are listening to Rock Your Midlife. If you want to reach out to me, it's the midlifewhisper.com. That's the midlifewhisper.com. See you after a short break. You are listening to Rock Your Midlife with Dr. Ellen, the Midlife Whisperer. Have a question for Dr. Ellen or her guests? Join us on the show at 866-472-5788. That's 866-472-5788. Now back to the show. Here again is Dr. Ellen, the Midlife Whisperer. Welcome back to Rock Your Midlife. I am thrilled that you are here. And if you want to reach out to me, again, it's the midlifewhisper.com. That's the midlifewhisper.com. And I want to let you know that the show is sponsored by the optimal.me. It's for the midlifer who wants to feel younger, stay active, independent, and energetic without pain or injury, and feel confident that this phase of life is their best yet. I have been using their site. I love it. It's the mid the optimal. Dot me. You get a free 30 days if you want to try it out. It's awesome if you're, you know, having some joint pains, difficulties, haven't been very mobile, or really are trying to get in shape. It is super fun and everything that you need is there. So take control of how you age with the optimal.me. You're never too old to take a smarter approach to aging and give yourself the freedom to make your next chapter your best chapter. And before the break, we were talking with Ed Begley Jr. He's a Golden Globe and seven-time Emmy-nominated actor 
who for decades has been a champion and ed educator for causes dedicated to protecting the earth. And kind of we were talking um, off the air, it was a little disturbing about with the fact that we consume about a credit card's worth of plastic every single week. That's right. The average American consumes that much plastic. Ed, can you elaborate on that? How are we consuming that much plastic? There's a very cred credible study done, cited by my dear friend, Deanna Cohen. She and Jackson Brown started the Plastic Pollution Coalition about the amount of plastics out in the ocean and our waterways and our highways and all over and in our bodies, sadly, because there's so much plastic that we let sit in the sun and that plastic migrates from the bottle into that liquid. We cook things, we microwave things in plastic, plastic beads and different toothpastes and makeups and things, little microplastics and all sorts of different substances that we buy and consume in a variety of ways. So the average person will consume about a credit card's worth of plastic every week. Most of it you pass through your body in the two obvious ways, but some of it you retain and that plastic builds up in our cells and is not good for us. Plastics are part of the many endocrine disruptors that we now take in uh, so much of the time. So we have to, uh, you know, we have to use less of them. Single use plastic is the luxury we can no longer afford. Get a nice metal container as you talked about earlier for your water, you know, uh, glass containers for your, keep your food in the refrigerator and what have you. There's many ways to get around it. I started using canvas bags many years ago, back in the seventies, of course. And I have some that are, some of them finally fell apart from the 70s, but I still have some that I use every day from the 80s and they last a long time and you're not paying some places charge, as you said earlier, a dime for a bag. Why pay anything for it? Get a nice 30 bag and use it for decades if you treat it right. So yeah, that's sell, what I do. They sell specific What's, bags. I have a whole set. They're white and they're specifically for produce. So you can use it for yes. produce. And I always, don't you hate it when you see people taking a plastic bag for like bananas or eggplants or all of these oranges, things that even have skin on them. So if you're, you know, if you're shopping for fruits and vegetables, yes, for something like maybe lettuce, you might, you know, greens, you might want some type of bag. And again, you can get these great reusable bags that are not plastic or hemp bags. There's lots of different things you can get, but so much of produce does not need a bag. And it's so true. If you're, you know, a woman going through menopause, that plastic can really have an impact on your endocrine system and the kind of the what you're experiencing as far as menopause. That was one of the first things I'm working with an integrative medical um, doc for my breast cancer diagnosis. I'm already doing it, but on the list was like, get rid of all plastics. So those plastics just end up, they might get recycled, but a lot of times they end up in landfills as well. So that's another awesome thing that you can do. So I'm so curious about this. You were one of the first environmentalists in Hollywood when it was not cool or sexy. This is before, you know, Angelina Jolie was like, have you seen that pose with her with the bees? She did this incredible, it was like, I think B-Day in March, where she was covered in bees to sort of bring oh, people yes. to bring yes, yes, yes. the importance of we've got to save the bees. If we don't have bees, we don't have food. But um, now everyone is echo on the echo bandwagon. Was it hard when you were one of the first pioneers? Like when you, you know, you brought, I could imagine that you're on set and you're having like, you know, there's no tofu pops yet, but you're having like, you know, tofu on your salad or beans and everyone else is like having cheeseburgers and fries and wondering why you're biking to work or driving an electric car when they've got their chauffeur. So what was it like in Hollywood? It was certainly that way in 1970 when I started, when I became a vegetarian, recycling, bought that electric car. Several people thought I lost my mind. And it was still like that a lot in 1990 when I kind of returned to electric cars. I stopped driving them for years and rode my bike and took the bus and occasionally had an internal combustion vehicle because electric cars in 1970 were basically golf carts and I had a family and needed to get them to school, what have you, the electric cart wouldn't do it. But I started again in 1990 doing it and people in Hollywood thought I was nutty. The following actually happened. I was on a movie called, what was it called? Page Master and I played the dad, Macaulay Culkin's dad. And I can see the assistant directors with the little headsets walking around. They seem disturbed about something. Yeah, he's right here. Yes, yes. No, I haven't talked to him yet. I'll talk to him right now. I finally said, what, is there something wrong? Did I do something wrong? Did I parked my electric vehicle in the wrong spot. I said, no, no, Ed, sit, sit down. We have a problem here. What, what's the problem? Am I being fired? No, no, you're not being fired. But we've been searching for weeks knowing you're going to come work. We have the scene tonight where you back the station wagon out of the driveway. We've been looking all over America and even in New Mexico. Nobody makes an electric station wagon. We couldn't find one, Ed. We're begging you, please don't storm off the set. We're going to, you know, I said, <laughs> it's going to be fine. I'll sit in electric, in a non-electric station wagon. It's on a hill. I'll roll it down the hill. Uh -huh. It'll be fine. 
you can have a team to drive it back up. So I can say I didn't drive a internal combustion car today, but we're going to be fine. I swear I'm not going to storm off the set. So people thought I was a little more strident than I think I was. Same thing happened one day, assistant director with the headset. I could see the talking again. Oh my God, what's going on? I said, what's the problem? I said, Ed, we're going to have them by lunch. I swear we're going to have it taken care of by lunch. Please don't be upset with us. Back and forth. Finally, I get out. What's going on? We don't have the recycling bins yet, but you know, we'll get them by lunch. They thought I was going to yell at them or something. And I, I'm not that kind of a guy. I encourage people to join me, but I really don't point fingers and I don't do that. I hope that you'll join me in what I think is a good way. Try it if you like it. I think it's good for the environment and in nearly every case also good financially. So give it a try and I think you'll like it. And many people have done just that and, and, and been happy with the changes. Yes, those are awesome stories. It must have been fun working with Macaulay Coughlin, Coughlin. But when did the tie change? When did it all of a sudden become cool and sexy to, you know, drive a Tesla and to be a vegan and, and you know, to wear organic clothing and all of those things? When did the tide start to change? It happened throughout the 90s. You know, I really didn't work much in the 90s. Not that I was blacklisted. I think people were just scared I was going to yell at them getting into their car or something. And that was not the case. So I I did a few films in the 90s, but not many. Uh, so I, but by 1999 and 2000, things changed and everybody just wanted to do it. They wanted to get an electric car or hybrid themselves. They wanted to get solar panels on the roof. And I love that you mentioned earlier the financial details of this nowadays. You don't have to spend, you know, six, not six, five figures like I did on a solar system back in 1990 and, you know, and, I, you don't need to do that. You can get a solar array as big as mine or bigger with no money down. You will send them about $70 a month, depending on the size, $70 a month for your solar lease, but you will save $100 a month on your electric bill. So you're putting 30 bucks in your pocket in your sleep. You can say, I didn't spend a nickel on these like this idiot Begley. You spent all this money on them. They're still working, by the way. They turns out they last a long time. Everybody thinks, oh, 10 years and they crumble in front of you. They don't, they last, they, they get diminished wattage, like 5% over a decade or what have you, but they really last for decades. The new ones do, the ones that they make nowadays with beautiful uh, robotic construction, what have you, they last many, many decades. So solar's come a long way. Everything on this list has gotten much more cost-effective and people should try it. And again, don't make a list of the things you can't do. Most people can't afford solar for one reason or another. They don't have a good rooftop for it, maybe. They can't afford today's electric car. Make the more interesting list, the things that you can do. Can you ride a bike if weather and fitness permit? Can you take public transportation? Can you put some weather stripping around your doors and windows? Can you buy a few light bulbs? Can you change your diet one day a week? See if you like it, do it too. And on and on. Try that stuff and make that list of important stuff that you can do, but do it today. Yeah, and do it with your family too. It is, it's really fun. I mean, I love to see how lightly, how, how little garbage we can produce. I think we actually have a dump down the street and I think we have like one garbage barrel a month at most because we recycle and compost everything. Um, so really, really good, good, good suggestions. And I would say too, the cool thing, solar is really changing. My son actually, um, over the summer, he's an engineering student and he was working for a company that actually programs the solar panels so they know how to catch the sun so that's like smart solar panels that actually rotate to maximize right. this amount of sun depending on the time of day so let's let's dig in and talk about your products and i have been using them um i bought the pet spray your um pr person sent me the floor cleaner which i've actually loved using pet spray my dog loves it i'm curious how did you get into entrepreneurship how did this idea start that like okay i'm gonna i make these things myself and now i'm gonna start actually being being an entrepreneur and start marketing them? I always, you know, kind of made my own cleaning products, vinegar and water and used baking soda to clean around the house. But I found over time that some, it didn't work on some stains and some problems, pet problems, what have you. The vinegar and water didn't quite get rid of the stain of the odor. The baking soda wouldn't quite get the, what I needed to scour away. So I sought out other green products and I quickly learned Seven, gener seven Generation made some wonderful ones. Eco's. Another Vermont it, company. Exactly. Great Vermont company. And uh, Ecos and other people like that made some green products and I use them. And a guy came up to me at a vegan restaurant in LA, Real Food Daily, and he said, I've been trying to reach you forever. I have these uh, green formulas and I want to make some products and have you help me promote them. I said, well, I'd love to do that. 
And I quickly learned he didn't have a bottling plant or anything. He was going to basically sell me drums of it, the product that he had, the green formula that he owned, and I would sell it. And I did that for a while, but then I just got too busy with my acting of, you know, shipping stuff myself out of my garage, buying a storage facility and storing pallets and product, you know, billing people on QuickBooks and getting them to pay their invoices in a timely manner. It was, as business people know, it's a lot of work, but I had another career in show business that picked up a lot right after I started doing that. So I had to abandon that company. Now we move on to this wonderful company, Lab Clean. I met this guy, Mark Cunningham. He said, I love what you're doing with your company, but you don't have time as an actor to do all that. I'll do all that. You help me vet the good formulas. We've got some good formulas we want to present to you for pet products and other things. You make sure that they're clean. We'll do independent third-party testing, you know, EPA testing, designed from the environment, good third-party testing. So you know they're clean. We're not just saying it. And then we'll go out there and promote them in the world. And that's just what I did. I don't have anything stored in my garage anymore. I don't have, you know, other than my tools and what I need in my garage, but uh, I, I allow this wonderful company Lab Clean to do, make these green products and I go around and promote them and uh, I'm very happy to do so because they're great products. And keep in mind though, I would love people to buy my products, Begley's Earth Responsible products, just buy any of them. Mark Cunningham is gonna kill me for saying this, but I mean it. Go get great center, seventh generation products, Ecos, get mine if you're so inclined, you know, go to, Amazon or go to Google search, go Begley cleaning products. It'll come right up like that. We'll be on Chewy soon, as you suggested. Uh, Walmart, we're on the Walmart website too. So give them a try. And they, the great thing about our products is they really work. You know, it's wonderful that they're clean and green. People want that, but they also have to work well, Ellen. If they don't work well, people aren't going to buy the second bottle. They want to feel good buying one, but they won't return to your shelf and buy it again if it doesn't clean good ours clean very aggressively very good and they're very very certified clean so give my product one of the fine green products to try today and it's really it's a it's a triple whammy because you know you're voting with your dollars so it's like if people buy the products walmart amazon costco they'll all start carrying more of those you're you're not taking in all of those toxins, and then you're also benefiting the environment. So really, is I mean, I I know the feeling that now when I smell like an ammonia, like I you know if I that stuff I don't go near it. But you can, the and the, the interesting thing is I think and correct me if you're experiencing the same thing. The cleaner you get in your life, the more you notice the chemicals. So right. I know myself if I eat, drink, consume on some matter or something that is you know toxic, I feel it right away. So it definitely your your liver starts working really good. So the products again, they're on Amazon, they're at Walmart. It's Begley's Earth Responsible Products. Um, so I'm curious. I know you can't give the uh, secret formula away, but what are some of the ingredients that make these plant based work stuff? Good? All wonderful plant based stuff, very clean stuff that is non toxic to our pets to adult people like you and I, and also babies. Think about it, there's babies crawling on the floor. Your pets are definitely crawling on the floor, putting their paws in their little baby hands in their mouth or sucking their toes or whatever babies do, you know, and they're crawling, crawling on that floor. A floor you just, in many cases, wash with a toxic chemical. You don't want that. You don't want kids getting that into their mouth, into their, you know, into their blood system. So. I'm out there and will continue to do so, helping my friends who contact me. Ed, we want you to help us stop this hazardous waste site. I go out there with them and we march with placards and say, stop the hazardous waste site. But the truth is, there's many other hazardous waste sites, not just outside our home, but in our home, under our sinks. We have horrible hazardous waste sites right under our sinks that we, at our own hand, by our own doing, created. So you got to get that stuff out of your house, certainly if you do as I've been suggesting for years, we want people to make their homes and offices more energy efficient and seal it up so you have a nice airtight home in Vermont or in Southern California where it gets more hot than cold, but you want to seal it up. Have it Now, once you've sealed it, you've done a good thing to save energy, but what if you have toxic elements in the house? If you have carpets that are off-gassing, you have woods with formaldehyde in them, you have toxic cleaning products under your sink or on your shelf. You don't want to have that stuff because homes are getting more energy efficient. We're sealing them up better. And you definitely want to, you don't want to have trouble by doing that wonderful thing of making your home more energy efficient. Yeah, I'm curious, is there a book or a website where people can kind of go and do an audit and say, okay, you know, check, I might have this issue, this issue to sort of 
get their, I know you've done, we can get into talking about your own home, about how people can sort of check their home and check kind of where they're at in terms of the, the amount of environmental impact they're having, as well as the amount of toxicity they have in their life. There are people that do all that, the people that do, you know, you know, air monitoring, what have you, and test your water and all that stuff. And that's very important. I would urge people to do that. But also when people regularly contact me and they do to this day, Ellen, I'm going to get solar on my rooftop. Who's that guy you use? Give me the number. I hand them a number. They go, what is this? It says, you know, Fred's home energy audit. I wanted solar. I said, I want you to get solar too, but not yet. You make that home or office more energy efficient. For every dollar you spend on energy efficiency, you will save $5 on the cost of your solar. I don't care if you're leasing it or buying it. Do your home energy audit first. Buy those energy efficient bulbs. Get the energy saving thermostat. Put the weather stripping around your doors and windows. Put in the attic insulation. All those things. If you're thinking of buying a new HVAC, get one that uses a lot less power. Do that first. Then the guy comes, geez, I thought I came here last time. It looked like you needed seven kilowatts. You're going to be fine now with four. You know, you're going to save in every way. Make your home and office more energy efficient. That's the right order to do it. And you're going to thank yourself. Something I like to do too is I, for water, water filtration, I use a Berkey filter, which is very inexpensive. You could actually literally put like lake water, even toilet, anything in it just to have yep. that as a resource. They're inexpensive. I mean, we have a humongous one. Another great thing to do is also essential oils. So if you, you know, are using air fresheners or perfumes and essential oils really also have lots of medicinal qualities. I do that too for um, bug spray. You know, you don't want to be spray and deet, although we, you know, we do have right. Lyme disease. I don't know if you've got Lyme disease and ticks out in California. We sure as heck have it here. My, my uh, fiance got Lyme disease last year but um, oh. we're really spraying everything and including spraying rosie our border collie we spray her with you know lemongrass and she smells really really sweet and the uh the bugs kind of stay off of her so that essential oils are great water, water filtration is great so let's talk a little bit um about your home in the past decade you and your wife have built a lead platinum home and building that that type of home is slow and precise and in each state it has to be certified. Tell us a bit about what it means to be a lead platinum home. There's a uh, wonderful kind of rating system. It's like miles per gallon in a car that the EPA does. It's uh, from the U.S. Green Building Con Council. It's called LEED and it's pronounced no, LEED no, actually. Not lead, sorry. Lead yeah, platinum. that's fine. LEED uh, platinum. Well, there's LEED silver, gold, and platinum. To get silver is takes some work and it's fairly easy to do for a lot of folks. Gold is a lot harder and to get silver rating on your, uh, sorry, platinum rating on your home is very difficult. You have to do everything, not just the energy efficient, efficiency of the home when it's done, your remodel or you're built from the ground up, but what happens during the construction process? How many you know dumpsters worth of trash did you make construction cut off and waste? Did you make while building it? How many cardboard boxes did the appliances come in? How much, how, what distance did that stone for your kitchen island, you know, where did that come from? Did it come from Italy? Is it Italian marble? And eh, you're going to get negative points. You know, you get it from a local quarry, you're going to get positive points. So all those things, it's very smart looking at all the, the HVAC, the solar on the rooftop, the solar hot water, the gray water system that we have the 10,000 gallon rainwater tank we have built underground. All that gets you positive points. You know, the little, even down to silly things that I never would have figured, there's a little stool near the front door and the back door where you, you can sit there and take your shoes off and improve the air quality in the house because your shoes have been outside walking yeah, and God crazy. knows what. You get like a quarter point or half a point for that, for having a little stool to sit on to take your shoes off to come in the house. I thought of everything, you know, construction waste, as I said, and everything. And so we have this wonderful home. Not everybody can do that. As I said, not everybody can get to the top of Mount Everest, but get to base camp and see how hard, how high you're able to climb. Do something today. Don't, get fo don't focus on that list of things you can't do. That's interesting. But what's more interesting is the list of things that you can do. Do those today. Yeah, my favorite thing is get rid of your lawn. I mean, right away. I, you know, I have neighbors and they have, and it's Vermont and they, you know, they've got the, it's, it's so many negatives to it. First of all, you got to mow it and like mowing it is no fun. We keep some lawn just right around the house because of, you know, uh, things like ticks and bug issues, but you got to mow it. And then people worry about weeds. So they, you know, fertilizer and weed killer and Roundup and all that stuff. And then, you know, on top of it, it's really bad for the wildlife. And we, again, I'm just really big on, 
helping out those bees, those pollinators, those bees, those butterflies. And we've have hummingbirds, which are absolutely amazing. So that's, that's something that you can do is gradually introduce, you know, different plants into- Milk thistle, all those oh, wonderful yeah. things like milk thistle. And we yep. need these pollinators. 65% of the produce that you and I buy at the market comes from pollinators. It wouldn't be there without pollinators. If we imagine losing 65% of the grocery of the produce in the in the market, we'd be in big trouble. We need those pollinators for our own survival. This stuff isn't just to save the whales and the owls, it's to save us. Yeah, it is really true because we all are interconnected. Another great thing to do too is visit your farmer's market. I mean, there I don't think there's a city in the country that doesn't have a farmer's market. I live, you know, in this little cluster of islands with, you know, my island has like 600 people. We have an awesome farmer's market and it feels so good to go to their farm stand to buy plants from them. I mean, I think I sent, spent, the, the, when it opened, I spent 200 bucks between, we bought tons of plants and we, uh, even in May, we already had uh, baby kale, we had bok choy, what else did I buy? Um, oh, asparagus is just incredible rhubarb. So visit, you know, it's it's all about think global, but buy local, buy things from your local farmers. And also when you go to your store, I know all of our markets always say who, who is local, even Costco, you can see if somebody, you know, is something coming from South America, like, do you really need to have those raspberries, you know, in January, we put up, we dry, like we have a pear tree, we dry our pears, we dry our apples. Um, for all winter long. It's really fun. We make applesauce, we make sauerkraut. And so just have fun with it, make it a joy. So it, it, there is so much you can do. So one, we have a couple of minutes left, literally two minutes, Ed, any last words on how to stay motivated, motivated to live an eco-friendly life? If people are listening and feeling, still feeling overwhelmed, not feeling empowered, what are your sort of final words of how, how do you start? How do you stay motivated? Accept the challenges. I'm not trying to hide them. We know we have trouble with climate change, many other issues, but really try to remember some of the successes too, like the air quality being better in LA, less smog in LA, like the Cuyahoga River not catching fire. The, the ozone depletion was so severe in the, in the uh, 80s uh, and early 90s, they banned CFCs. They warned us, we're never gonna be able to buy an air conditioner again, they'll be too expensive. We won't be able to buy a refrigerator. As you and I know, you can buy both. and we've fix that problem with the ozone depletion to a great deal, to a great extent. So we have successes, celebrate those and do it because it's right. It's not just right for the owls and the whales and the pollinators, it's right for us. It's what we need to do for our own survival. All right, well, thank you, Ed. It has been such a joy and pleasure getting to know you. You really are one of the nicest guys in Hollywood. I love what you're doing, folks. Go check out Ed's products. They're on Amazon, they're on Walmart. And if you wanna connect with me, it's themidlifewhisperer.com. It's themidlifewhisperer.com and check out our sponsor, theoptimal.me. It's an amazing organization. Have a great week and we'll catch you next week. Thanks for watching. Thank you so much, Dr. Ellen.